So about six weeks ago now, Sarah Nolan came into my office and she said, okay, so for our, our annual giving campaign, the theme is going to be walk in love. And then she, she suggested, when we kick off that theme in October, do you think you could weave that into your sermon? So I thought to myself, well, sure. I mean, the theme of love does kind of run throughout Scripture, right? How hard can it be? And then I looked at the lessons assigned for today. <laughs> right? Clearly, some of you were wondering. A little bit of a sidebar for those of you who aren't familiar with, with um, uh, how lessons get assigned. So the Episcopal Church, like many mainline traditions, we participate in the common lectionary. And so the lessons are assigned Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. They're the same lessons read in a variety of churches. Um, and, and the task for preachers is to kind of, well, play with the cards that are dealt. Um, I'm not fond of the cards dealt for today. <laughs> so we, we, we've, got, we've got Job, right? This, this story that, that has sort of become you know, a, a, a fable addressing the question of, of suffering. Job, Job is, is, is righteous. Job is, is blameless. Job is this upstanding character. And yet, if you know anything about him, Job also is an icon for, for unfair suffering. What we hear, what we hear today is, is a conversation between God and, and Satan, better translated, actually, as the adversary. Where, where Satan is like, ah, this Job guy, I'm not sure about him. And God, God sort of says, no, 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 he's good. And Satan's like, no, I'm not sure about him. And so then God says, all right, well, have a go with him. There, he's yours. Can you feel the love? <laughs> and, and so these terrible things happen to Job. Uh, before the passage we read today, Job has lost his property. He's lost his son and daughter. And then today's lesson describes how Job is afflicted with these sores that run from his toes to his head. Nothing says I love you like sores that run from your toes to your head. So that's, so that's Job. I read that and I thought, well, let's see what the gospel has to offer. Surely there's a little love to be found there. And, right, you're laughing, you're wondering, you're looking. Let me know if you find it, okay? So instead what we get is, is these very difficult words that, uh, about marriage and about divorce. Uh, um, a little bit of context. The Pharisees, they're growing nervous because this Jesus character is, is gaining in, 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 in authority and, 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 and they're, they're, I think they're intimidated. They're anxious about his growing popularity. And so, as Mark writes, they are looking to put him to a test. And they ask him this, this question, well, where do you stand on, on, on divorce? And, and, of course, the commandments were there. They knew the answer to this, but they're trying to trap Jesus. And so Jesus gives them a, a very conventional answer. He says, well, uh, you know, it's not lawful for a man to divorce his wife. But then, by the way, he also adds, you know, the part about a wife divorcing her husband, which would have been quite subversive and scandalous at the time. Anyhow, he adds it's not, it's not lawful. Then the next piece of the story, the disciples follow up, right? And, 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 and he goes back and, 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 and Jesus says, you know, whoever divorces and then marries again, they're committing adultery. That's hard stuff. That's painful stuff, isn't it? And, and, and I'm reading all this, and, and I'm thinking to myself, maybe I should ask Sarah if we push the campaign to start next week. Because <laughs> I, think, I think Susan's preaching next week, and we'll just... But these are the words we get. 
Man, I'm wondering how these words say anything to us about walking in love. I go back and I read them a second or third time. And actually, I think it was the third time that, that, that this phrase jumps out to me from the gospel according to Mark. Because of a hardness of heart. A hardness of heart. And I think to myself, Anna, maybe in that phrase, there's something that, that, that sort of in a paradoxical way can speak to us about how we walk in love. Hang on to that thread for just a little bit. Because look, I, I, as, as tempted as I am to just go there, I, I can't weenie out on these other scriptures. Um, um, I, I, I can't just pretend like these other hard words, like we haven't heard them today. So, so if you'll, you'll bear with me just for a minute, I do want to only briefly, but if only briefly, I do want to return to them. Because they are words that that make reading scripture so hard sometimes and make living faithfully even more complicated. Look, Job is, is such a rich character. His suffering has become sort of the icon of, of, of suffering. And frankly, the questions that he asks and the, the emotions that he feels are familiar to all of us. God, why did you do this to me? Or God, how could you let this happen to me? It's not fair. I didn't deserve this. Where were you as I was struggling? Any of those questions familiar to you? Sure. So here's what I want to tell you, even if, if briefly. First of all, I want to tell you that, that Job, just to be clear, Job is a story. It's not a historical account. It is a story that speaks to the suffering of our Hebrew ancestors, the suffering that seems so, so burdensome, so, uh, so inexplicable. They're wondering to their God, why, where, how? And, and, and so we understand that those questions, they are universal. And I want to tell you that, that, that I want to tell you that, that even as the story comes to an end, a little bit of a spoiler alert if you haven't read it, even as the story comes to an end, I want to tell you that, well, that, that Job doesn't get all the answers to his questions. That is true. But somehow, Job, Job is still beloved by God, even though even though Job throws a whopper of a temper tantrum later on. If you haven't ever read it, go, go back and read that. Job is still beloved by God. Job is still faithful to God. And in the end, Job finds himself blessed by God beyond his wildest imaginings. That's the arc of Job. And the final thing I want to say about Job, in terms of my own wrestling, in terms of my own understanding, is this, I do not believe God does these things to us. Amen. I, amen. I do not. I do not even believe that God sort of lets these things passively, disinterestedly happen to us. God is not some puppet master pulling strings from above, even though sometimes I wish God would. But truth be told, if God did, there'd be plenty more times where we'd be like, whoa, I didn't see that happening. I don't believe God's a puppet master. What I do believe is that as we are struggling, as we are suffering, God is near, God is weeping with us. Does that answer all the questions that Job has? It doesn't for me, it probably doesn't for you. But like Harold Kushner found, as he wrote, when bad things happen to good people, we've got a choice. We can imagine that God is all-powerful and God is controlling everything, in which case, man, that's a hard God to have a relationship with. Or we can, we can imagine that God, that God doesn't control everything, God doesn't make everything happen, but God is a loving God and that God will, will walk and weep with us, in which case, we've got a God we can continue to be with. I invite you to imagine the latter. 
Mark's words, Mark's words, this teaching taken out as a small slice itself have been used to hurt, to dictate teachings, to, 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 to oppress people for so long, right? His teachings have been used to sort of, to, well, to, to, to take those divorced persons and if not excommunicate them, marginalize them. His teachings, these words have been used in some ways to suggest that we don't get a chance for remarriage. His teachings have been used in some ways to suggest that marriage between two people of the same gender who love each other, who want to be committed to each other, is not the true definition of marriage. There's no denying that these words have been used to hurt. And yet, one of the beauties of being an Episcopalian is that we understand the faithful life through scripture, tradition, and reason. Let me say that again, through scripture, tradition, and reason. And we don't take any one verse out of scripture and say, well, there it is, that's the answer to question number 73. (laughs) So sure, this exchange happens. But let's be clear, it happens because the Pharisees are testing Jesus, And Jesus does a rather deft response. He shifts from the conversation divorce and he talks about the intention of marriage. And and it is clear that marriage is seen as a sacred covenant and that God's hope is that we enter into these covenants for a lifetime. There's no denying that. There's no denying that. And of course, that exchange where Jesus suggests to be married again is to commit adultery is problematic. But think about the other exchanges in our scriptures where we hear from God that that, that God continually forgives us, offers us grace, gives us a second and a third chance to enter into new covenants. That's in scripture too. And so I cannot believe that our God would, would want us to stay in a marriage that is oppressive, in a marriage that is abusive, in a marriage that is no longer life-giving. I cannot believe that our God would, would condemn us to a life of loneliness. And I cannot believe that our God would say to two people who love each other, even if they are of the same gender identity, that no, you can't experience the blessing of this covenant. Scripture, tradition, and reason tells us that our understanding is broader than any one verse, any one line. Oh, it's been used to hurt, it's been used to oppress. But let us break open these words so that they might be used to inspire and to heal and to invite people to wholeness. So we all set? (laughs) No, no. No, but I promised Sarah I would get back to the giving and to this notion of walking in love. We could spend a lifetime, we should spend a lifetime wrestling with the scriptures that we've heard today. But let's get back to this notion of a hardness of heart, a hardness of heart. It was because of a hardness of heart that that this Satan could not imagine a character like Job who is so faithful and blameless. It was because of a hardness of heart that this Satan wanted to torture and challenge Job. It was because of a hardness of heart, actually, (laughs) that Job's wife at the end of today's passage says, you know what, you should curse God and just die. (laughs) Thanks, honey, for that advice. It was, it was because of a hardness of heart that the Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus, that they are intimidated by, by the expansiveness of his love, by his concern for people who have been, who have been not only marginalized, but written off, who, who, who have been seen as well as invisible and unimportant. So it's because of a hardness of heart that the Pharisees aren't able to imagine a breaking open of the commandments. Do you see how that hardness of heart affects us? How can we walk fully in love if our hearts are hard? 
A hardness of heart leads us to, leads us to, to test and to doubt. A hardness of heart brings us to, to thirst for judgment. A hardness of heart makes it impossible for us to, to live hopefully, much less give generously. A hardness of heart makes it impossible for us to live faithfully. Do you see the problem with a hardness of heart? How can we walk in love with our hearts hard? How can we? This, this season, we're going to be hearing what it means to look and to walk in love. We're going to be hearing over the next several weeks about walking in love. And, and I'm looking forward to hearing what others have to say about it. I'm looking forward to, to making that walk with all of you. Let me suggest that today, the first step in that walk is to soften our hardened hearts. If we're going to walk fully in love, if we're going to be a community that can tend to the wounds of one another, if we're going to be a community that can speak of God's love outside these doors in a time when God's love seems to be in short supply, then we first must soften our own hearts wherever they're hard. So let me ask you to consider where, where is it, with whom might it be that your heart is hardened? I doubt that there's one of us who doesn't have a little corner that's just a little rough when it comes to that person over there, when it comes to that situation right here, right? Where might it be that you find your heart hardened. How can you soften it in the days and weeks to come? What might it feel like if your heart was released from that hardness? How can you walk in love? I invite you to think about that. And if you hear a whisper, in the back of your head, whoa, whoa, don't go there. <laughs> Dare you do that? Listen to another whisper from Jesus who asks, Dare you not? Amen.